Well, the pandemic is also having a devastating effect on the economy. According to the latest predictions from the independent tax and spending watchdog, the OBR, that is the Office for Budget Responsibility, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, speaking at the daily Downing Street news conference, said he was deeply troubled by the figures. The OBR warns that if the lockdown lasts three months, with another three months, let's say, of partial lifting, the UK economy could shrink by 35% between April and June this year before a likely recovery, they say. In the model, uh, experts predicted unemployment could rise to 10% of the working population. That would be more than double uh, the current unemployment levels and amount to a rise of 2 million jobless people. Our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, picks up the uh, analysis. Stuck on the shelf, stuck without trade. The shutdown's draining life from Chris Norcott's cider business, from the whole economy too. We have a warehouse full of cider that we cannot sell and we are funding the short through through internet orders that come through into our business from our website. This is currently our only source of income. Coronavirus presenting the government, not just with a health emergency, but a decades defining downturn. These are tough times and there will be more to come. But we came into this crisis with a fundamentally sound economy People are, of course, devastated by the numbers of people losing their lives. But tonight, with warnings of two million extra people unemployed, people are also desperately worried about their jobs. If you can level with people, do you think we will be feeling the costs of this crisis for a generation? I also, when I see these numbers, um, deeply troubled. And as I've, I think, consistently said when I've been at this podium and elsewhere, you know, this is going to be hard. It, you know, our economy is going to take a significant hit. And as I've said before, that's not an abstract thing. People are going to feel that in, in their jobs and in their household incomes. To your point about a generation, no, I, I very much hope that the measures we've put in place will allow us to do in, exactly as the OBR have said, bounce back. When the shutters roll up, the car parks fill again and the closed signs flip back over, the report suggests the economy could recover fast. But with two million extra people potentially out of work, Labour fears today's predictions. Unfortunately, they are quite a good reflection of, of the situation we're likely to find ourselves in. But of course, you know, this really is down to the measures that can be put in place to sustain businesses and jobs. They are absolutely critical, not just now, but for the future health of our economy. These numbers are well-informed guesses, not final, not inked in. But the direction is clear and this virus is dragging the economy down. Jobs are being lost and the national income is shrinking. And that affects not just how ministers balance lifting restrictions in the weeks and months to come, but what governments can and can't pay for in future, how much they borrow and how much tax we pay. People say I capture the essence of those personalities. Rebecca Douglas's wedding photography business has disappeared for now. I've been employed since I was 13, I'm now 36. I don't know what it's like to not work. So I think as an entrepreneur, um, there are ways in which you're sort of soul searching and trying to find a route through um, where perhaps it feels quite unfair. She's trying to find ways through. The job for so many of us, the job for the country too. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News. Well, the potential damage to the economy is not just a short-term threat. There will certainly be a longer-term impact as well. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, has been looking uh, in more detail at the latest forecasts. A month down the road and still surreal scenes of a closed country. The cogs of the economy paused to give space to protect public health. But it's not without its own cost. And today the government's own internal forecaster set out what that could be if these scenes last for a further two months. The numbers are huge. Britain's economy could shrink by 13% in 2020 in the case of a three-month coronavirus lockdown. That would be a far larger contraction than seen during the financial crisis over a decade ago. The world wars and the only precedent is the depression of 1920-21. to 21. Although there is a bounce back, it won't be, under their scenario, until next year. This means permanent damage and government borrowing at 14% of the size of the economy, the highest since World War II. 
If you were to see the sort of decline in GDP that we think would be consistent with a three-month lockdown, then you wouldn't have seen a quarterly fall in the economy like that uh, in living memory. The hope, though, is that that is going to be a temporary rather than a permanent problem and that we don't end up scarring the long-term potential uh, of the economy. These scenarios are worse than the gloomy global forecasts of the International Monetary Fund. This is something that we haven't seen in any of our lifetimes. Uh, you know, the last crisis was the major crisis was the global financial crisis. At that time, the global economy shrunk by 0.1 percent. So it was negative 0.1 percent. Right now, in our baseline, we're talking about growth at negative 3 percent. So this is the worst since the Great Depression. So no surprise that shutting down hits the economy hard. But the sheer magnitude of the hit is shocking. This is what the shutdown looks like in real life at an industrial park. The furniture manufacturers closed, the cranes over there idle, the freight distributors shut, the brewing depot not working either. Why? To protect public health, to protect the NHS. So there was a trade-off going into this. Does the same trade-off exist coming out of this? Lift the lockdown to boost the economy? It isn't quite as simple as that. One of Britain's top medicines companies, AstraZeneca, is helping ramp up testing. But the boss says the absence of vaccines and cures has consequences for a return to normality. We have to balance, of course, saving as many lives as possible, but also return to a normal life and restart the economy because a lot of misery and, uh, and, and, and problems is now generated with so many people losing jobs, etc. It's not going to be a few weeks, is it? It's going to be months... Maybe longer. If we all do a good job working together, we could get there. My hope is that we'll move out of this acute phase into a more chronic uh, situation. A more chronic situation will have lower number of cases that you can manage. In the absence of a vaccine, even with a massive economic hit, it won't be as simple as just lifting the lockdown. Well, let's go live to the Treasury uh, in Whitehall and uh, Faisal is there for us tonight. Faisal, in your report, you mentioned the sheer magnitude of the hit that we're talking about here. Tell us more about that. Yeah, these are staggering numbers, numbers that the people that work at this institution would never have imagined seeing on a chart about the British economy in their lifetimes. Two months ago, a fall of a third of a percent over three months would have been seen as pretty bad. This is about a third of the entire economy. And yes, there is a bounce back, but the overall impact over the course of the year is, a con is an economy about a seventh smaller with consequences for jobs, consequences for public borrowing too. And so it's important that uh, even these grim numbers uh, underlying that is a strong bounce back. In order to get that, you need to get the Treasury's rescue money out into the economy. You need to get some sort of handle over the health crisis and you need to provide confidence to workers and consumers. You won't get that if the lockdown's lifted prematurely. Faisal, thanks very much indeed. Again, at the Treasury, Faisal Islam, our economics editor.